I've been teaching from Luke chapter 15, and I've been talking on lost and found. We've talked about the lost sheep, we've talked about the lost coin, and today we are looking at the lost son. I'm going to deal with the lost son this week and next week because I, I couldn't do all of it in one week. It's uh, far more detailed than the other ones. I was, and so although I said this was going to be a three-part message, it's going to end up being a four-part message. So we're talking about the lost son, and uh, we go to Luke chapter 15 from verses 11 to 14. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to, him, to them his livelihood. And, now many, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Um, this uh, gentleman is normally called the prodigal son, and the word prodigal simply means wasteful, uh, the son who wastes. Now, I want you to remember what prompted Jesus to talk about these three parables. Uh, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the scribes came to him and said, Lord, we have a problem with you. You receive sinners, and you eat with them. In other words, when they, when they come to you, you receive them, and when they invite you, you go to them. So uh, they had a problem with Jesus on that because the Pharisees were people who were uh, committed to separation of what they call holy from the unholy. And if they felt that you were not a holy person, they would not visit you. If you lived in those days, most of you would never have a visit from a Pharisee because they will look at you and say that even your smile is not holy. Your haircut is not holy. Your shoes are not holy. Uh, and, and so uh, they were very particular about the life of the people. So they came to Jesus complaining. And Jesus is now responding and in answering the question of why he receives sinners and why he goes to them, he tells us the three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and now the parable of the lost son. There is something very unique about this parable. Just, I want you to note uh, before I go to talk about it. Um, in the earlier parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, after they were found, after they were found, Jesus added a notation. After the parable, he would say, so there was great joy or there's great joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. He said it after the parable of the lost sheep. He said it after the parable of the lost coin. However, in this parable, Jesus did not use that phrase when he concluded the parable. He didn't say, uh, there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And of course, when you look at the parable, it seems like the, 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 the boy uh, who went out was a sinner. So why didn't Jesus say the same thing he said about the lost sheep and the lost coin? Uh, because Jesus is talking about two kinds of lost people. And the clue you will get is that he starts by talking about a father and his sons. So the first two uh, parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, talked about sinners, unbelievers, people who are in the world. But this one talks about Christians who backslide. Christians who backslide. People who are with the Father, who know the Father, who know God, who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and turn back into the world. So this is what this parable 
uh, is talking about. It's not talking about a new person uh, who comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord. It's talking about a person who already knows the Lord, knows the Father, is a son, is a daughter of the Father, but falls away into sin. So I want you to have that in mind as we look at this parable of the lost son. And the ladies, you are also included in the lost son. All right. So there are two main uh, aspects of this parable, uh, uh, the going away and the return. And this week, I will just focus on the going away, what took the son away and how he ended up uh, when he went away. Next week, I'll talk about how he returned to the father. So let's look at the going away from the father. How did it start? How can a son who lives with a father go away? What went wrong? And the first thing you note that went wrong is that the son was self-centered. Self-centeredness. Remember when I was talking about the things that take people away from God, I talked about self-centeredness as one of them. This is a self-centered child. How do we know? He only saw what he could get from his father. He asked for what was his. Isn't it amazing that the, 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 the wealth belonged to the father? The inheritance was for the father. But he says, Father, give me what is mine. He only saw what he could get from his father. And this is where he started going wrong. This is where everything started going wrong. He was fixated on himself. His language is similar to many in our generation today. Sometimes in the church, Christians, we want what is ours. We want it now. We say things, I want it now. I want to make it. I can't wait, wait any longer. And all that we're looking for is for something that God will give us now. Now, I believe God blesses us. And I believe that God is a good God. And I believe that God blesses his children. And I believe God prospers his children and heals his children. But if all your Christian life is based on what you can get from God, you are in danger of doing what this gentleman did. Because if all you do is, Lord, bless me, Lord, favor me, Lord, increase me, Lord, heal me, Lord, prosper me. If that is all your Christian life, then you are in danger. Because that's what this gentleman is doing. He's only looking not to serve the father, but to take what the father has for himself. Sometimes I feel that Christianity, especially, I can't speak for other countries, but I, especially in our country, has become like that. All our prayers is for Lord bless me. Lord bless me. Lord increase me. Lord destroy my enemies. Everything, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, my. Every time we go before the Lord, we are asking for something for ourselves. Is that how our Christian life is? Is that how your Christian life is? Every time you start praying, you are talking about yourself and what you want from God. And, and yes, God wants you to have it. The interesting thing about this father is that he didn't reject giving the son's portion to him. He didn't say, no, I'll not give it to you. He says, if that's what you want, that's all the relationship you're going to have with me is to have my inheritance, have things, but never have me. Because sometimes we have things that God gives us, but we never have him. And that's the trouble with this man. It's self-centeredness, self-conceit. And as much as God wants us to have things, our Christian life should not be about things. As much as God wants to prosper you, your Christian life must not be about prosperity. As much as God wants you to be the head and not the tail, 
the Christian life should not always be, Lord, I want to be the head. Lord, promote me. Lord, increase me. Yes, he wants you to have it. But our Christian life goes beyond that. So the first problem we have with this guy is he wants something for himself. He has, wants nothing to do with the father. You know, a lot of Christians, if you will give them miracles without God, they will take miracles without God. If you put breakthrough and God on the table, they will pick breakthrough and leave God. Because we are so fixated on the gift and not the giver of the gift. If our Christian life starts on that premise... We are going to get into prodigal living. So that's where we see this guy. Self-centeredness. That's the problem. Give me, give me, give me. Then from there, from self-centeredness, comes the next step. Separation. Separation. The passage says, he journeyed to a far country. He separated from the Father. He received from him, but separated from him. Received from God, but turned away from God. It's amazing where a lot of us have taken our Christianity. We'll go for prayer meeting. We'll go for all night meeting. Not because we love God. For all of you who go for prayer meetings and pray very long, have you ever considered why you're doing it? Is it really because you want to be in the presence of God? Or you want something from him? And the moment this gentleman got what he wanted, he separated from his father. I mean, you would have thought that he would say, okay, father, give me what, what is mine. He gets what is mine, stays with the father and starts using the father's gifts next door to grow. So you see that the real reason why he wanted something for himself was he hated to be in the presence of the father. He didn't want his father. He didn't want to be accountable. He didn't want his father's correction. He didn't want his father's direction. He didn't want his father to say, don't do that. All he want is, bless me and I don't want you again. And there are many Christians. Bless me, but I don't want you to interfere in my life. He journeyed far away from his father. Usually, this is the first step that many people take when they turn away from God. They separate themselves. They disconnect. Sometimes they stop coming to church. When they're broke, they are in church. They are in a meeting. They are praying. Every prayer meeting. The day so-called breakthrough comes. Now they have a lot of excuse not to be in church. You see the separation happening. And the separation is happening because their heart was not for God in the first place. Their heart was for themselves. Once they get what they want, God is out of the picture. Sometimes people do that. They stop going to church. Sometimes they go to another church where no one knows them. Because now they can sin freely because they, nobody knows them. Take a girlfriend and go to another church. Sometimes they will say, well, you know, I don't want to go to church again. You know, it's all crowd. I just want something private. And I've, I've seen a lot of rich people. They hire private prophets, private pastors. Come and do a Bible study in my house. Come, you know, all I want is just love God. I don't want to go to church. And so they have this man of God so-called that they can control. Who can see the right vision for them. 
who never sees anything wrong about them. He tells them it will be well, it will be well. You will prosper. Your enemies will be defeated. Aren't you suspicious that this hired prophet is working for wages? Aren't you suspicious that those prophecies have all been engineered for salary? You've hired him. What do you want him to say? That you are wrong? You have that young boy come and every vision he sees is good for you. And they are the ones who see all your enemies. Because they know you are a paranoid person. Your head is not correct. So they are twisting your head. Separation. And that's what's happened to our young friend here. Sometimes people who are separating from God act like now they have a deeper understanding of scripture. They become cynical. They question everything about God. Everything about the Bible. They talk down on all pastors. They don't believe any pastor again. They talk down on all Christians. They say Christians are all hypocrites. They talk down on all churches. You know what they are doing? They just want to be alone. It has nothing to do with spirituality. Because true spirituality will connect you to God, to his word, and to his people. If you think you know so much and you're so spiritually deep and you're disconnected from God and his people and his house, check your spirituality. You are separating. You're giving yourself excuses. And I'm sure this guy was saying the same thing. My father's house is boring. You know, my father is overbearing. He wants to control my destiny. <laughs> The kinds of, we know one can control my destiny. So he's out. There is separation. And I hope you're not there. And from separation comes the next step. Spending or squandering. He used up all that his father gave him. He left home rich. The father had invested so much into him. He started using what the father had given to him without replenishing what he was spending. It's like the Christian who attends church, you know. You start, you start from children's church, you learn so much. You start from youth church, you learn so much. And you sit in church and hear all the sermons. So you are so full. And then one day you say, you know, I'll just stay at home. I believe that I can worship God in my own heart. You're going to squander everything you have learned over the last 30 years of your life. And yes, you can quote scripture. And you can do all the things that you can do based on what has been invested into you? That's where this guy is. The first part of spending is very exciting. That's when you can afford to spend. It's the fun phase of spending. Prodigal living can be very exciting at phase one. When you start sinning, oh, oh, prodigal living is very fun. Got a good boyfriend, it's going to be fun. Good girlfriend, it's going to be fun. You started doing drugs, it's going to be fun. Started drinking, it's going to be fun. Spending stage. And everything seems, this is the good life. This is what my father has been denying me. These days a lot of Christians raised in the church, raised in the house of God. Learned so much from God. Somehow 
feel that they have to start drinking. So they go and now they are learning wine tasting. Delicate wine. This is from France. This is from that. And this was cultivated from grape on a mountain. And this is from that. And this is from that. And now they're smoking cigars. And they're blowing. And, and you look at them, you just feel like, wow, they have arrived. But all they're doing is they're spending. And when you're spending, and you're you're spending, you have people to spend with you. Phase one seems fun. The fun side. But there is a phase two. When the fun wears away. And things start changing. And that's what happened to this guy. He spent everything. He spent his relationship with his father. Spent the father's money. Spent an inheritance. Blew it all. Number four, scarcity. Spending is going to take you to scarcity. This is phase two. Scarcity is when you become a slave to a degenerate life. Now you are in prison. You can't get out again. He has finished spending his father's money. What the father had given him over a lifetime is gone in a short period of time. Now, there is scarcity. Everything is gone. You know, you, you started doing the drugs and you said you were high. And now you are a drug addict. And it's no longer high. It's low. Your whole life is miserable. You're twitching. You can't get yourself free. What used to give you fun has now imprisoned you. You started drinking. You said, oh, this is nice. The good life. That's why pastor is always preaching we shouldn't drink. Pastor knows that this, this is the good life. He doesn't want us to have life. God doesn't want us to have. Now you squander and squander and squander. Now you are a drunkard. But you took that girl and you thought you could get rid of her. Now you're stuck. And she has pictures of you. She has your conversations. She's recorded everything on phone. Listen, it is a digital world and anybody who thinks you will not leave footprints, you are joking. You have footprints. And one day, accountability will come. So here you are, you can't get rid of the girl. <laughs> you are stuck. Now it's no longer fun. Now you're running away. Now you're running away. You're hiding. You're praying. Now you're going for prayer meeting. Pray, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Please, let her die. Let her die. Let her die. <laughs> for some people, you know, the way we treat God, as if God, you know, he's a machine there. He doesn't have intelligence. I've gone to mess up my life, Lord. Now kill the girl. So my secret will not come out. That's what David thought he could do. I've gone to mess up my life. Now kill Uriah. <laughs> the man is now down. This is somebody who had the father. He's a Christian. He's not an unbeliever. This is the journey of a Christian. Born again, church person. Scarcity has become a slave. And if you read how the Bible describes his slave life from verse 14. It says, when he has spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. That means events conspired against him. 
He's broke and there is farming. So there's a global economic crisis, but you are already broke before the crisis came. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you were broke already and the global economic crisis comes. So now you are in want. <laughs> Sometimes events can conspire against you. All right. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country and, sent, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he will hardly have filled his stomach with the pots that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He spent all, there is farming. He's now going to join himself to a depraved pig farmer. His best buddy now is a pig farmer. Your best friend now is a degenerate man. You used to have good friends. Now look at your friends. Look at your friends. Look at the people you hang out around with. You've left your father's house. Now look at your friends. Drug addicts, drunkards, womanizers, gamblers. That's the people you've joined with. And you really think you have a good life. For those who say, I don't trust church people. Now, whom do you trust? Pig farmers? <laughs> whom do you trust again? You know, church is full of hypocrites. You know, these pastors, they are all hypocrites. But the pig farmer is a nice guy. You, you, you like the pig farmer better. The worst of a child of God is the better than the best of a sinner. The church is not perfect. Church people make mistakes and they, they will do things that will hurt you. But the best out there cannot be anywhere near the worst in the church. Because if for nothing, they hear the word of God every time and the Holy Spirit convicts them every time and people will correct them and th there will be redemption. But he joined himself to a pig farmer. And the Bible says that he wanted to eat, eat the food of the pigs. He's now moved from his father's house, eating the food of his father to the food of pigs. But the, the saddest part is that the passage says no one gave him anything. They threw him away. They threw him away. You know, sometimes people who are down, will bring you down and mock you. You say, hey, Osofu, Osofu. Hey, you, those days you were going to church. Hey, and you were the one who was saying, as soon as you see where you are, all they wanted is to testify negatively about you. You used to make them feel bad. Now you are down to their level. Don't ever think that everybody who is trying to encourage you into a life wants the best for you. Most of them just want companionship in their sinful life. They don't want you to judge them again. They don't want your life to condemn them. You are the only one who says, my wife, my wife, my wife, my wife, my wife. They want you to stop doing that because when you say my wife and you're talking to oh uh, sweetheart I'm going for a meeting I'll be back I'm with this person here this ah ah they want you to be a liar like them they want you to live a secret life like them say so they pull you dark 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 and when you hit rock bottom everybody leaves you nobody gave him anything let me tell you this. The Christian life is not a perfect life. But it is the best life among all the options available. It's the best among all the options. 
is the best. Going to church is the best option you have. Why are you going to go? Which one is better? Going to watch football? Going to, where, where, where is better? Where would you go to and have what you had this morning? Worshipping, music, dancing, the word of God, being encouraged, being guided, being exalted. Where, do you go, where are you going to get that? You can watch Manchester United all you want. They will not encourage you. They will not lift you up. They are going to lose their games. You will be depressed. <laughs> and you will be so depressed. And you wonder, why am I watching these people? You are paying for your own depression. And it's every week after week. They buy players, it doesn't work. <laughs> All I'm saying is, your best life is with God. Is with God's people in the house of the Lord. In the house of your father. Your best life is with God. With God's people. In God's house. That's your best life. It's not perfect. But it's the best. And this guy found out. out. He hit rock bottom. Question is. What is he going to do now that he has hit rock bottom? And next week, we're going to find out what to do when you have hit the rock bottom and you've messed up your life. What do you do after that? Because there is a way back to the father. And the father still wants you back with himself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read your word, we are reminded of ourselves that sometimes we can be selfish and self-centered, seek our own and never seek you. And sometimes we can be so bored with life with you that we want to go and experiment with another life. But today, Lord, help us to know that your house is the best place to be. Knowing you is the best thing. Staying with your people is the best place. And help us, Lord, to fix our hearts on you. To fix our minds on you. To settle on you. And desire you more than the things you give to us. We know you bless us with good things and you fill our mouths with good things and you prosper us. But help us not never to put our eyes on the things you give us. But to always fix our eyes on you, the giver of everything that we have. And help us, Lord, like the psalmist, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.